So welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Roger Berkowitz, and I'm the founder and academic director here at the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard. And i um, thrilled to be here tonight. Um, this, is, uh, this, this lecture tonight, uh, which my colleague um, Nick Dunn is going to introduce formally in, in a couple minutes as, the, as part of our collaboration with um, the De Gruyter Press in Germany, um, is part this year uh, of our spring conference at the Arendt Center on Between Power and Authority on Hannah Arendt and Constitutionalism. Um, uh, you know, I'm teaching constitutional law this semester, and we're grappling with the questions of, um, of, of, of what it means to have a constitution and to constitute, and for Arendt, uh, this question of that in order to found freedom, which he thinks the Constitution is, you need both power and authority. Um, and last year at, in Verona at the RN Circle, Peg Birmingham, who's going to talk to you in a little bit, gave an uh, extraordinary paper on this topic that led to a two-day conversation amongst many of the people here. Um, and we've reconvened some of them and brought some new people into the conversation. And so this talk is uh, an attempt to rekindle and push forward uh, a conversation amongst friends and, and colleagues uh, on this question of what does it mean to found freedom uh, in a world and how a constitution uh, is an essential part of that. Um, I'm gonna let my colleague Nick Dunn introduce uh, Peg. I just wanna say one personal thing. Um, uh, two of the people in the room today are, um, people who first introduced me to Hannah Arendt. Um, one is Dana Villa, who was my undergraduate professor and with whom I read The Human Condition my junior year at Amherst College. And um, it made a huge impact on me. Didn't make me an Arendt scholar, but uh, it was uh, one of the first times I read Hannah Arendt and I uh, really appreciate your being here, Dana, so thank you. Um, and then Peg. Uh, who, um, while I was in grad school and long before I was an RN scholar, uh, ran a, a, a segment of the uh, Collegium Phenomenologicum in, uh, in, in Italy. And uh, we read Hannah Arendt, and she was the, the leader of that session, and she included me in it, to which I'm eternally grateful. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to welcome both Dana and Peg here and have Peg giving the keynote. Let me introduce my colleague, uh, Nick Dunn, who's the Clemens von Klemperer, postdoctoral fellow here at the Hannah Arendt Center. Nick, you're up. Thanks very much. Good evening and uh, welcome. My name is Nicholas Dunn. Uh, welcome to the second annual De Gruyter Arendt Center Lecture in Political Thinking. Uh, tonight's event, as Roger said, serves also as the keynote address for uh, our two-day conference on Arendt's constitutional and legal thought called Between Power and Authority, Arendt on the Co Constitution and the Courts. Um, and we're thrilled to have a number of really renowned Arendt scholars joining us for this event from all over, uh, Israel, Italy. Um, uh, and their talks will uh, continue tomorrow. They began earlier this afternoon. They'll continue all day tomorrow. So um, those sessions are free and open to the public. We invite you to... Uh, Join us tomorrow, there's programs in the back. Um, and welcome also to just those who are uh, visiting, uh, and I think there's a number of people as well who are joining us virtually from all over, members of the center. Uh, before I introduce our lecturer, I just wanna uh, say thanks to a few people. Uh, first to Roger, uh, founder and director of the Arendt Center, uh, and his vision for uh, an intellectual space that allows for the kind of public thinking uh, by which we can engage with some of the most pressing questions uh, of our day. Um, uh, thanks also just to the rest of our staff at the Arendt Center, uh, to the fantastic student workers who've helped organize this event, getting all these different people to campus. Um, also, I'd like to thank uh, Serena Parata. She's the editorial director for Classical Studies and Philosophy at uh, Walter de Gruyter Publishing, um, whose generous support makes tonight's keynote lecture possible. Um, last year, I was pleased to announce the beginning of a partnership between De Gruyter and the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard College. 
Uh, and in, in addition to this annual lecture series, uh, this joint ve venture has actually led to several other new initiatives, uh, including a conference on RNT that took place at Bard College Berlin last summer, uh, and a new book series on RNT. Um, as we probably all know, there's been a surge of interest uh, in Hannah Arendt's thought in recent years, both among scholars and uh, among the public more broadly. Um, but despite this increased attention to Arendt, there's actually not yet to be a book series dedicated to her work. Uh, so since last year, in fact, de Gruyter has launched two uh, new book series on Arendt, a thematic cluster corresponding to the scholarly and public interest in Arendt more broadly. Uh, the first series, called Reading Arendt Today, will include monographs and collections of essays that feature scholarly debates, textual critical analysis, and new interpretations of Arendt's work, including its context, genesis, significance, and reception. Uh, the series will highlight scholarship that makes use of the new critical edition of Arendt, which presents all of her published and unpublished work uh, together for the first time. Uh, and the series editors are Anna Oysterschulte of the Free University in Berlin, uh, Patchen Markell of Cornell University, and our own Thomas Wild, professor of German at Bard, and research director for the Hannah Arendt Center. Uh, the second series, Thinking with Arendt, will present contemporary works of philosophy and political theory, which take Arendt as their point of departure, as a source of inspiration or provocation, or as part of a critical dialogue with others. Uh, in the spirit of thinking what we are doing, the series seeks to highlight how new readings of Arendt illuminate our present uh, and allow us to engage in conversations that open onto the world. Uh, the series will be edited by Roger Berkowitz and Jana Schmidt, Assistant Professor of German Studies at BART. The de Gruyter Arendt Center Lecture in Political Thinking aims to promote and foster the legacy of Hannah Arendt's thought. Uh, it's delivered each spring at Bard College by a distinguished scholar who has made significant contributions to our understanding of Hannah Arendt and her work. Uh, last year, the inaugural de Gruyter Arendt lecture was delivered by Professor Linda Zerilli, the University of Chicago, and was entitled Arendt and the Problem of Democratic Persuasion. Uh, this year, we decided to keep with the Chicago theme. Uh, Peg Birmingham is Professor of Philosophy at DePaul University, uh, where she has taught since 1992. She also holds an affiliated research position at the University of Western Sydney. Uh, Professor Birmingham received her PhD from Duquesne University, where she wrote her dissertation on Heidegger and the Problem of Freedom and the Will. Uh, and in fact, I'm told her first job was just down the street at Marist College uh, in Poughkeepsie, where she taught for four years. She's the editor of Philosophy Today, one of the top journals for continental philosophy. And she specializes in social and political philosophy, philosophy of law, and feminist theory. She has published on a range of figures in the history of philosophy and political thought, including Machiavelli, Hobbes, Rousseau, Heidegger, Rancière, Agamben, and Foucault, as well as a range of topics, including human rights, violence, radical evil, deception, and the temporality of the political. And she is one of the leading scholars of Hannah Arendt in the United States. Uh, her 2006 book, Hannah Arendt and Human Rights, The Predicament of Common Responsibility, examines Arendt's notions, notion of the right to have rights. Uh, and she's currently completing uh, a book, uh, Hannah Arendt and Glory, Earthly Immortality in an Age of Superfluousness. Uh, her lecture tonight is entitled The Problem of Constitutional Authority in a Secular Age. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Peg Birmingham. Thank you, Nick, for that wonderful introduction. And um, thank you, Roger Berkowitz, for the invitation to give this lecture. It's a, a great honor to be giving, to be giving the, Greuter, the, the Greuter Lecture here at the Hannah Arendt Center at uh, Bard College. And I, again, I could not be more honored by the invitation. Um, I also want to just uh, remind uh, everyone that there's a handout with the citations that I'll be referring to. And for those of you who are uh, online, uh, I've been uh, told also that Phil told me that the, this has been po posted online as well. So just to make that comment. 
So I want to begin my lecture by considering the issue of the secular, or what Hannah Arendt calls secularization, and why this raises the problematic of authority in the constituting of a new political space, particularly, and we've heard much of some of this already this afternoon and this morning, uh, particularly the problematic of authority in the revolutionary constitution of a new political space, which has as its aims the liberation from oppression and the founding of a new political space of freedom and equality. What kind of authority, if any, is at work in this new beginning, this new constitution of a political space? And here I will confine my remarks to Arendt's thoughts on the revolutionary founding of the US Constitution. And in conclusion, I want to turn to what Arendt finds most problematic in the US Constitution. Namely, how does it endure? And I submit that in our present political moment, the urgent problematic Arendt points to is not the authority of the beginning, but the endurance of this beginning and its political institutions. Arendt turns to Machiavelli, who she claims is the first to face the problem of how to think a new authority in a secular age. And this is the first citation. More important in our context of thinking the meaning of revolution is that Machiavelli was the first to visualize the rise of a purely secular realm whose laws and principles of action were independent of the teachings of the gospel, of the church in particular, and of moral standards transcending the sphere of human affairs in general. It was for this reason that he insisted that people who enter politics should first learn how not to be good, that is, how not to act according to Christian precepts. Arendt agrees entirely with Machiavelli's claim that modern revolutions require a break with Christianity and more generally with absolutes, theological or otherwise. She points out that and despite, and I quote, this is not on the handout, the, despite the not infrequent claim that all modern re revolutions are essentially Christian in origin, the early Christian sects, with their stress on the equality of souls before God, its open contempt for all public powers, and its promise of a kingdom in heaven, were not forerunners of either modern revolutions or secularization. She points out that Luther's Reformation never intended to found a new secular order, but rather to liberate a truly Christian life from the secular realm. The point here for Arendt following Machiavelli is that modern revolutions are inherently secular in liberating the political from any absolute foundation. Indeed, she goes on to claim, and this is the second citation on the handout, secularization itself and not the contents of Christian teachings constitute the origin of revolution. To put a fine point on it, for Arendt, secularization is the condition of modern revolutions establishing, as she puts it, a secular realm with a dignity of its own. And by the secular, she means, and this is uh, citation three, politically, secularism means no more than religious creeds and institutions have no publicly binding authority and that conversely, political life has no religious sanction. Losing its foundation in the theological, the secular political realm gains its dignity, but loses its claim to an absolute authority. 
Now recently, Samuel Moyne, who we heard a little bit about in the earlier session, Roger pointed uh, to him in his thought. Recently, Samuel Moyne focuses on Arendt's observation in On Revolution that it was easier for religion to leave politics than for politics to leave religion. And what Moyne follows this to claim that Arendt never concedes the loss of an absolute. And this is citation four, this is Moyne. One cannot fail to register her, Arendt, insistence that even such politics, self-contained and post-metaphysical, must have continuing recourse to an absolute of the kind that metaphysics in the form of religion provided more plausibly and effortlessly than revolution could easily succeed in doing. Moyne goes on to argue that while Arendt claims that this continuous recourse to an absolute not need to be religion, nevertheless, she never gives up her claim that politics needs some kind of absolute authority to establish the legitimacy of political power and the legality of positive laws. However, when Arendt argues that it's easier for religion to leave politics, she is pointing, and then for politics to leave religion, she's pointing to the immense difficulty of finding a secular, worldly source of authority, not rooted in the transcendent. However, and against Moyne, Arendt argues that the betrayal of the revolution occurred when the revolutionaries attempted to reinstall an absolute authority as the foundation of worldly political affairs. She claims that this abandonment of the secular takes two different forms, either by falling into the infinite and absolute stream of history or into the absolute sovereignty of the nation state. To briefly take up the first, Arendt argues that the revolutionary concept of the political was abandoned when such, rev such revolutionaries, such as Robespierre, viewed themselves as part of a historical undertow that swept everything in its midst, uh, including its own children. It devours its own children. As she puts it, history became the new absolute in human affairs. The second betrayal was to establish the nation state as sovereign and, and absolute authority. Arendt could not be more straightforward in her assessment of the destructive role the nation state has played in reestablishing an absolute foundation to the political. As she points out, and this is quote, citation five, European absolutism in theory and praxis, the existence of an absolute sovereign whose will is the source of both power and law was a relatively new phenomenon. It had been the first and most conspicuous consequence of what we call secularization, namely the emancipation of the secular power from the authority of the church. Secularization then for her is, just to repeat, emancipation of secular power from the authority of the church. Again, this emancipation is the condition for modern revolutions. The betrayal of this secularized emancipation is to re reintroduce the absolute back into politics either in the form of history or the sovereign nation state, and often those two accompany each other. Now I want to pause for a moment and consider the important distinction Arendt is making between secularization on the one hand and secularism on the other, as I think it addresses recent critiques of the secular and the accompanying call for a post secular politics. Talat Assad, for example, in Formations of the Secular, 
argues that the emergence of a secular politics is tied to the capitalist expropriation and exploitation and to a notion of historical progress inseparable from European nationalism and its hegemonic colonial project. In his book, Why I Am Not a Secularist, William Connolly agrees, calling the Western nationalist imperial project, rooted as it is in a notion of historical progress, Connolly calls this secularism's conceit. Now, Arendt would agree with both critiques with the caveat that a distinction must be made between secularism on the one hand and secularization on the other. Secularism reintroduces the absolute into a modern concept of the political through a notion of historical progress or through European nationalism. So if that's what secularism is, and this is what Assad and Connolly say it is, then she would agree this would be, this would be something we, we would want to perhaps call for something like a post-secular politics, a critique of both European nationalism and this notion of history as progressive and teleological. But as we have seen, Arendt is critical of both the theological notion of history and national sovereignty. Moreover, and this speaks to those secular, post-secular calls for a reintroduction of the importance of religion in human affairs. And just coming back to our conversation this afternoon, it's, it's, sim it's not just the religious right but it's also a, a, a strand that I think runs through, through decolonial theory as well. Uh, a, a, reintrodu a reintroduction of religion and the re-enchantment of the world, again, uh, they're arguing uh, against Weber. Now what Arendt claims is that secularism not only rejects any form of the absolute in politics, it never denies the importance of religion. As she points out, this would be an impossibility. As she writes in her Denktagebuch, and this is citation six, secularization, which never denied religious content, this is an impossibility, but rather posed the ancient problem of earthly immortality anew. So again, she's not denying the importance of religion in human affairs, but only claiming that secularization, with secular, secularization, religion has no publicly binding authority and political life has no religious sanction. Now, having claimed that absolute authority has no place in politics, understood as a space of freedom and equality, the question can be raised, and it really discontinues our conversations earlier today, does Arendt claim any source of authority for the constitution of, of these revolutionary public uh, political spaces, even if they're not absolute? In other words, is she able to, to provide any help in thinking a worldly non-absolute authority? And further, would she want to? Would she want to provide such help? Would she want authority in the realm of politics? Now to answer this question, I want to turn briefly to her essay, What is Authority? Wherein she claims that the notion of political authority is entirely Roman, as Dana has already uh, brought to our attention. Only the Romans had a concept of authority that was taken directly from the political, worldly appearance, ex experience, namely the founding of Rome. The Greeks, by contrast, take their notion of authority from the non-political experience of the parent-child and the teacher-student relation. 
both of which for her cannot serve as models of political authority, and indeed produce disastrous consequences if imported into the political. This is citation seven. In the political realm, we deal always with adults who are past the age of education, properly speaking, and politics or the right to participate in the management of public affairs begins precisely where education has come to an end. And indeed, she goes on to point out that whenever the model of education is superimposed on politics, those who pretend to educate are really wanting to dominate. Now, it seems to me that this is consistent with her claim at the end of the Eichmann trial that politics is not the nursery, and we do not obey the laws like children obey their parents. We enter politics as adults and as equals, whose relationship with one another is not one of command and obedience. By contrast, as just mentioned, for her, the Roman notion of authority is drawn from the political experience of the founding of Rome and the sacredness this foundation has, which remains binding for all future generations. Indeed, the absolute authority of this founding through time is achieved through the unbroken tradition which ties back, and there she uses the, the Latin religere, the tying back from which we get religion or religious. This unbroken tradition ties every new generation back to the sacred beginning. Thus the force of the unbroken tradition is essential to continue the authority of the sacredness of the beginning. Strikingly, she points out that the Roman notion of authority it does not have its foundation in religion. Certainly, she points out that gods were present, Janus, the god of beginning, and Hector, the god of remembrance. But the sacredness is not due to the divine, but the political experience of founding a new city to which every generation is tied back. That's the notion there of religion. This is citation eight. Authority, insofar as it's based on tradition, is of Roman political origin and was monopolized by the church only when it became the political as well as the spiritual heir of the Roman Empire. So I want to emphasize that it's the break in tradition which for Arendt characterizes the modern age and not the loss of the belief in the divine that fractures the Roman triangle or trinity of authority, religion, and tradition and causes the loss of political authority. She points out that there have been many attempts to save it. Luther, for example, questions temporal authority but wants to leave secure tradition and religion. Hobbes desires to lose tradition while leaving intact authority and religion in the figure of Leviathan as the mortal god. And the humanists want to give up religion and authority, yet still want to, to claim an unbroken tradition which in itself would hold some kind of authority. Now, contrary to Moyne's claim, Arendt does not join the Restoration Project. She is unwavering in her claim that the break in tradition is irrevocable. And further, she does not lament this loss of authority that occurs in its wake. And there we could even think of the collection of, uh, early collection of hers, uh, Called, titled Between the Past and the Future. And that, that notion of a gap, of standing in the gap between the past and the future, which has, 
which is the gap is the break in tradition. I think I counted at least six or seven essays where Arendt returns in one way or another to a reading of this gap, this break between the past and the future. And she really is saying that's where all of us today stand, both in acting and thinking and in judging. This is the gap of all three activities. So, for, but, so for, first of all, just to repeat, the break in tradition for Arendt is irrevocable, and she does not lament the loss. For her, the falling apart of the Trinity is liberating. Notably, at the conclusion of her essay on authority, she does not defend the notion or argue that we need a new version of it. Indeed, and this follows from the beginning of the essay, she points out without much fuss at all that when asking the question of authority, we must simply ask, what was authority? And she concludes the essay on a celebratory note. History, tradition, now a rubble heap at our feet, that's her metaphor, Tradition or history, now a rubble heap at our feet, allows for a new relation, fresh eyes to the past. The loss of religious belief opens up the possibility of a new form of faith. And the loss of authority allows for confronting, and this is citation nine, a new without the religious trust in a sacred beginning and without the protection of traditional and therefore self-evident standards of behavior by the elementary problems of living, of human living together. So with the loss of authority, we can finally be confronted without religious trust, without falling back on some standards of behavior but we can confront together the elementary problems of human living together. And I'm going to return to this in the conclusion of my remarks. Although Arendt is unwavering in her claim that with the break in tradition, we have lost all ties to an authoritative foundation to new constitutional foundings, nevertheless, I, it seems to me, she does not leave us entirely bereft of finding a source of legitimacy to power and the le legality of positive laws. And she finds this source of legitimacy in the revolutionary action itself, which as I said earlier, the twofold aims of liberation from oppression and the founding of a new political space of freedom and, and equality. She writes, and this is citation 10 on a handout, freedom and equality are political principles determined not by a transcendental authority before which all humans qua humans are equal, nor by a general human fate like death, which one day takes all men equally from the, the world. Rather, they are intrinsically worldly principles which grow up directly from the coming together. The authority of the Constitution, its elementary, objective, worldly character, as Arendt puts it, is given in these constituting principles imminent to action itself. Again, there is no transcendental source of these principles. They are inherent to acting for the sake of freedom and equality, and they last only insofar as the action continues. These principles provide direction and orientation, but they do not tell us what to do. And here I think Ronald Dworkin's distinction between a principle and its enactment is helpful here, and I think it follows Arendt very closely. 
He gives the example of telling his children to act fairly. Fairly is the principle, but it does not tell them what to do. It only tells them to act in a fair manner. The latter needs to be worked out, and there will certainly be different conceptions of fairness that are up for debate and argument in the household. So too with the principles of freedom and equality. Again, they map out a direction, but they do not tell us specifically what it is we should be doing. We do not obey these principles. We act for their sake. And moreover, these principles are historical principles. We might call them historical universals, insofar as they claim universality, <coughs> but always conditioned historically. Thus, when we speak of the authority of the Supreme Court decisions, it seems to me that from an Arendtian perspective, we are not talking about the authority of the actual decisions. For instance, the conception of equality in the Plessy case that established the principle of separate but equal and the explicit overturning of this concept of equality in Brown. The decision can be and was politically debated, argued, and overturned. We could, we could say that another example would be Roe v. Wade and its overturning. And in, the, in our present moment, the vigorous political response to overturning the overturning. The authority of the court resides not in the specific decisions. It resides only in the principles that animate these decisions. And it seems to me that the loss of the authority of this judicial institution, which has been said many times this, today, this judicial institution, which is also a political institution, will occur, the, uh, the loss of its authority will occur if it's perceived as abandoning altogether the principle of equality or freedom. To summarize then, insofar as the US Constitution emerges out of revolutionary acting together for the sake of freedom and equality, we do not look, need to look for a transcendent source of authority for the legitimacy of power or the legality of our positive laws. These inaugural principles are imminent to the constituting itself. As Oren points out, the beginning of action, the RK, the principle, carries its principle with it, and therefore the legitimacy of power and the law that, uh, and, uh, which these principles are imminent to it. And the beginning with its inaugural principles must be carried on by those who come after, also beginners, who in the carrying on will begin anew. And let me just stop there. I hope I'm not taking too much time. This is, I think, something that's missed in her analysis of action in the human condition. And that is that, that action is not only the, 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 the capacity for beginning something new, but it must be inseparable from the bearing of the beginning, of carrying the beginning forward. She says, if that doesn't happen, if we just have a new beginning, a new principle, an RK or a rule, if that becomes separated from the, from the bearing of it, of carrying it forward, this is the moment of political sovereignty. Because what we get then is that the beginning becomes the rule and it's being carried forward, but it's not. The rule then, those of us who come after are simply obeying the rule. So that's where we get the notion of sovereignty, is once the beginning and the bearing of the beginning become separate. And that's why I wanted to stress here that that the beginning must be carried on by those who come after. And insofar as those who come after are also beginners, this, be, this carrying on will be itself a new beginning. 
So it will not be static. It won't be just carrying on the status quo, and I'm going to come back to that in a moment. So Arendt is not calling for a return to some sacred and inviolable beginning or origin to which we are tied back to, allowing for something like the US Constitution being a sacred document or giving rise to some civil religion. I think this is what the original constitutionalists claim with their idea of original intent. Somehow we could be tied back to this. Instead, for Arendt, these principles of freedom and action and equality constitute the living spirit of the Constitution, which will endure only so long as there are citizens who are willing to carry on these principles and bear their burden. Now, before reflecting further on the problem of the endurance of these founding principles, I want to return to Arendt's insistence that in a democratically constituted political space, citizens do not obey the law, but give their consent to it. Indeed, it was the mutual consent that established the US Republic. We hold these truths to be self-evident. And I think here she's pointing to, the, we, ho we hold these principles to be self-evident for us. Now, in her essay on civil disobedience, Oren claims that this mutual consent requires the political duty to dissent, to not support the laws when they are viewed as unjust. And what I'd like to suggest is that for Oren, then, citizens are the authorities on whether the laws are just or unjust. Moreover, she points out the newcomer, by virtue of being welcomed into the community, gives its tacit consent to it. She calls this the universalis consensus that marks the citizen's relation to the law. However, at just this point in the essay on civil disobedience, she pauses. And the pause is significant. She pauses to consider the status of those who were not part of the constituting of the new political space with its mutual promising and consent. She points to those held in chattel slavery who were explicitly excluded from the constituting and who certainly did not give their consent to such an exclusion. In fact, Oren points out that even with the 13th and 14th Amendments to the Constitution, due process under the law, except for criminals, and this is a significant exception, and the recognition of equal citizenship to all born on U.S. soil, nevertheless, she points out, even with these two amendments, nevertheless, systematic racism continues in the United States, raising the question of whether a radical new beginning to the US Constitution is necessary, more than simply a carrying on of the beginning. And inspired by Arendt, I want to raise this question. Will the founding principles endure only by a radical new beginning, a new constituting or founding of a political space of freedom and equality, and the new in political institutions emerging from this. And this is, I think, what she suggests in this pause, where she asks really the question, will, will amendments to the Constitution be enough? Or does there have to be a new beginning? Does something else have to happen? A new constituting. And I want to emphasize here that there's nothing contradictory between new beginnings 
and the endurance of the principles of equality and freedom. Indeed, their endurance may very well lie in new beginnings and new political institutions. While Arendt is often viewed as an uncritical celebrant of the US Constitution, it is precisely the endurance of these principles that so worries Arendt as she examines the American Revolution. And surprisingly for a thinker who is often read as dismissing the passions from the political, specifically criticizing the French Revolution for including the sentiment of pity, Arendt is worried when she turns to the American Revolution by the lack of passion in the constitution of US political space. She writes of the American Revolution, re revolutionaries, and this is citation 11. They found it easy to think of passions in terms of desire and to banish it from any connotation of its original meaning, which is pratine, to suffer and to endure. This lack of experience gives their theories, even if they are sound, an air of light-mindedness, a certain weightlessness, which will put into jeopardy their durability. For humanly speaking, it is endurance which enables man to create durability and continuity. She suggests here that the endurance of these principles require more than sound theories guided by reason. Their endurance requires they are animated by political affects or passions. Now I want to suggest that Arendt's concluding remarks to a lecture course given in 1954 at UC Berkeley gives us insight to how she might be thinking these political affects. And I stress here political affects. There are other affects and sentiments for her that are, that are not political. But what are the political affects that the American revolutionaries were too light-minded in simply dismissing from their considerations in the Constitution. The lecture, the 1954 lecture, ends with a reflection on the contemporary state of politics. She points out, and this is uh, citation 12, the modern growth of worldlessness, the withering away of everything between us, can also be described as the spread of the desert. By the desert, she means the space between, another name for the interessa of the public space. The space between us has become withered in the way plants wither in the scorching summer heat, becoming dry and shrunken. The desert, she claims, is another name for the nihilism of our present age, with its accompanying cynicism and gullibility in which people believe both in nothing and at the same time are willing to believe in anything. The urgent political task, she claims, and this is citation 13, is to transform the desert and this sense of nihilism, cynicism, gullibility into a world through the conjoined faculties of passion and action. That's citation 13. The conjoined facul faculties of passion and action. In these concluding remarks to the 1954 lecture, Arendt defines passion as the faculty of suffering and with it the virtue of endurance, which she claims is the most easily lost. And this is citation 14. By suffering, she means to endure or undergo the passion rather than dismissing it. The political affects, the passions, 
are most easily lost, yet nonetheless more fundamental, she claims, than action, insofar as, she, I quote, and this should be on the uh, citation, the handout, only those who can endure the passion of living under desert conditions can be trusted to summon up in themselves the courage that lies at the root of action, of becoming an active being. Now, just to say something about these political affects, for Arendt, political affects are world-disclosing in the sense that their reality is measured, and this is the last citation, 15, not in the force, the passion, with which the passion affects the soul, but rather by the amount of reality the passion tr transmits to it. So for instance, this is in her Lessing e essay, she says that fear and hope are not properly political affects because fear causes us to shrink back from the world and hope causes us to jump over it. Anger, she says, is the properly political affect. Now, political affects have for her two further characteristics, and again, this is in the Lessing essay, openness to others and the disclosure of the fundamental plurality that marks our being in the world with others. Now, in her Berkeley lecture, she explicitly mentions courage, but it is not alone in her list of the world-disclosing political affects among which can also be counted anger, gratitude, lamentation, and joy, as well as the horror and shame at what has happened and what human beings are capable of doing. It seems to me then that these are the affects which can counter the pervasive cynicism and gullibility of our present moment. And I submit that these are the political affects animating what Arendt more generally calls love of the world. Far removed from patriotism rooted in the love of the nation and a unified notion of the people. And as Arendt points out, set the world on fire, and I add, continues to do so. Instead, it's what Montesquieu calls the love of equality, the love of virtue, that characterizes the spirit of the laws in a democracy in distinction to the monarchy's love of honor or the fear that animates tyranny. Returning one final time to Arendt's essay, What is Authority? And thinking about what has happened to authority in, in, in the thought of Hannah Arendt, I want to submit that Arendt offers something like a secularized trinity, no longer Roman and no longer rooted in any kind of authority, certainly not authoritative origins. As I noted above at the conclusion of the essay, she claims that the loss of tradition opens up for the first time a relation to the past many paths. The loss of religion opens up the possibility of a new form of faith, and the loss of, a, of authority allows for confronting the elementary problems of inhabiting the earth and world together. Now, I would like to suggest, and this is a, a speculation for further thought, but I leave this because I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to to suggest is that this secularized trinity that I'm about to, may be a way that we can think of a way of being together politically, to say it rather simply. Now Arendt understands our relation to the past as that of reconciliation, which Roger Berkowitz's writings have brought to our attention. Our relationship to the past is one of facing up to the shock of reality of what has happened and act actively bearing its burden. Further, the loss of belief 
opens up the possibility of a new form of faith, no longer tied to a sacred origin, but instead a tying together in what Arendt calls a new form of solidarity that bears the burden of the past and acts in concert for the sake of new beginnings. This is a faith in one another and in this world, not the world to come or a world beyond, but this world with all its horrors, but also its joy in acting in concert together and in gratitude for this time on earth. And finally, the loss of authority opens up our capacity for critical judgment, animated by the inaugural principles of freedom and equality, to confront anew the problems of inhabiting the world and earth together. So I'm suggesting that this, this secularized trinity of reconciliation, solidarity, and critical judgment might be a way that we could think of, again, not, not a source of authority, but a way of reanimating the spirit of the laws, the principles of freedom and equality that are the only source of legitimacy for the US Constitution, the, the, the uh, animate the living spirit of freedom and equality. Now, in her essay on the crisis of education, Arendt asked the question of whether we love our children enough to educate them to take responsibility for the world. Echoing this question and free, rephrasing it to address the problem of constitutional authority in the secular age, I submit that the Arendtian question might be, do we love the principles of freedom and equality enough to bear the burden of ensuring their continued in, to bear the burden of ensuring their continued endurance in animating political and legal institutions constituted by them and which may very well include the courage of new beginnings and new political and juridical institutions to ensure this endurance Thank you. You, con you concluded, uh, I think a lot of us have been in involved in conversations about the tragedy of Israel and et cetera, et cetera, right now as a particularistic, uh, horrific of our time. And your conclusion actually um, is a, a marvelous bringing together of ideas um, that moves us in the direction of possibilities that um, I have been present in. I make a habit of staying with people who have something constructive <coughs> to say and not just angry. And it's consistent with the sense of possibilities that have come forward from many voices um, in the public square as we grapple with the tragedy of both Trump and Netanyahu. And so um, all I can say is thanks so much for, the, for, for working us so carefully through to these marvelous senses of possibility. Thank you. Somebody pick up an errant perspective from this one. <laughs> um, hi, Peg. Thank you so much um, for the talk. It was brilliant in all senses of the term. Um, mostly because when I first started reading Arendt, I thought, and I thought she was very pessimistic about things, but the second time around I saw these these very hopeful passages that the conclusion of your talk especially brings out very, very beautifully. Um, but there is one thing that I've always struggled with um, every time I read Arendt, and I think she, she also acknowledges it. It is the material realities of the world. 
And we saw from Olivia's talk how Arendt herself um, tries to distance the creation, the establishment of the Constitution from um, becoming too material. Um, but as soon as we start talking about wanting to progress towards a way of being together politically or, or wanting to um, advance some sort of political or juridical institution based on solidi solidarity, reconciliation. Anyone who has ever participated in strikes would know how difficult that is when pay can be docked for yeah. an entire month. And, and that ends up affecting the ways in which we live together. Yeah. And Arendt tries um, to differentiate between consumerism, excess commun uh, consumption, and private property in, in the human condition. But I still don't find that acknowledgment, um, at least not enough. And I'm wondering if the secularized trinity that you propose, if there's something within there that also responds to the forms of neo-capitalism that, that we all suffer from. Thank you, thank you. It gives me an opportunity to, to, to talk about something I've been working on a lot. It's part of this, this, this forthcoming book. I actually have a chapter called Arendt's Disavowal of Economic Superfluousness. But let me go back. Um, this, this call for a new form of solidarity uh, is actually part of the concluding remarks of the first edition of Origins called The Burden of Our Time. And that th the first edition does not end with the, the notion of the human being as a beginning. It ends with a call for solidarity with the murdered, the expelled, and the still suffering. It ends with apostles, Acts, I think it's 16, don't quote me on that last. Uh, she responds, particularly to the suffering, we are all here. Do not despair, we are all here. So, and, and she goes on to, um, in, in the trade publication Meridian, she talks about why then was there this new chapter, Ideology and Terror, in the second edition that goes forward. And she says, I reluctantly allowed for that. It was at the suggestion of her publisher. And she says that actually the, the original conclusion was much more in keeping with the spirit of the work. So what I would like to suggest, and thank you for that wonderful question, is that I think, if, I don't, I don't want to be too long-winded here, that Arendt is it's grappling, she has a conflict with herself when it comes to the relationship between the economic and the political. So let's just stay with on revolution. She begins by saying that the, 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 the tremendous insight of Marx, and she's utterly favorable, as well as Adam Smith, is that poverty is not a natural phenomenon. It's politically produced. And therefore, it can be politically addressed. And then you turn the page, and there she is saying, you know, poverty, you know, this is a concern with private bodily needs, and poverty should have been kept away out of the streets of Paris. And you think, what is going on? So I think if you look at all of the, the essays uh, in which she talks about revolution, let's just stay with that. I think Arendt says two, two different things. And, and not, it, 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 so for instance, I think on the one hand, she wants a strict distinction. On the other, I think she, what she really wants, and this is in her interviews on revolution and politics, is that she wants the political to regulate the economic but not that there can be a strict separation between the political and the economic. And then just to answer, and this is, this is sort of the, the uh, for me, the, the thread of the book, I think her most important work is the origins of, of totalitarianism, particularly the chapter on imperialism. 
uh, and Shamal, we, we had talked about that this morning, and I think it also came up, it ca I know it came up in your, your, your talk this morning. So there she's, she is immensely concerned with capitalism, the production of superfluousness, the, ex the, the expropriation of the peasantry from the land, which she says is the beginning of the modern age, um, and the production of superfluousness, which she says, and I think, Shmel, this is something you were pointing to. She says it was the capitalist imperial project that at its heart was the production of superfluousness and the driving engine is racism. She said that became the perfect superfluousness, her words, the perfect superfluousness of the death camps. So I, I think the, the, the human condition has to be reread from her analysis of imperialism. I don't think, I don't think that she dismisses materiality from, from uh, the vita activa, and I think she does not dismiss labor and work from having a shared political concern with political action. So I think, I think that, but she's not consistent. She's not. Uh, we have to admit that. And I, I think it, in some ways, particularly in unrevolution, I'm going, I'm, go, I'm, I'm saying way too much here. Um, in unrevolution, she's either on the balcony with Robespierre or she's on the street with the actors, and she cannot decide where she wants to be. That's my, that's my reading of Hannah Arendt in On Revolution. She doesn't know where to take her place. So I'll leave it at that, but thank you for the question. Uh, hi, thank you for your talk. So um, Edwin O. Wilson had the book Consilience, talking about how we should look at all different fields of knowledge, and it seems to me on revolution, Aaron Arndt, who I think, correct me if I'm wrong, said she's not a was not a philosopher. So I think viewing her br more broadly than that. So I was wondering to you, because you are, how how are philosophers these days are are philosophers looking at other fields of knowledge such as you know evolutionary biology, anthropology, law, history, these other th fields when interpreting, for example, Hannah Arndt and her on revolution. Oh, I think so. I, I've, I've read Consilience. I think it's, it's, it's a little biologically deterministic. I think it's a very anti-Arendtian view of, of the, 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 the sort of the unified field theory from a biological point of view. Uh, but I, of course, I think Arendt's being taken up by, by many different disciplines right now uh, who are all talking to one another, whether that be architecture or uh, uh, cinema, uh, aesthetics. Uh, so yeah, I think that, that uh, and, and I think, I think she's actually a, a thinker that calls for that interdisciplinary uh, conversation because she herself was. The, the, the literature, the, the, the way that literature runs through her theory and informs what she's thinking about is fundamental. Um, Thank you. Hi, Peg. I want to I want to pick up on some of the remarks you made at the very end on on the secular trinity of reconciliation, solidarity, and critical judgment, um, which you said can reanimate the spirit of laws, um, and maybe even ask you to connect it a little bit to glory, which I know you're working and, and writing about. So, um, you know, in the social question chapter of on revolution, she makes she has these two pages on solidarity versus pity that yeah. you know are, are are not talked about that much, and I and I think for a very particular reason, which is she says that um, solidarity, though it may be aroused by suffering, is not guided by it, and it comprehends the rich, the strong, and the rich no less than the weak and the poor, which I think, especially in our comradeship. Mm -hmm. Marx's version of solidarity goes, goes against that. Mm -hmm. But then she said, compared with the sentiment of pity, 
It may appear cold and abstract, for it remains committed to ideas, to greatness, to honor, and to dignity, and maybe even glory. And so I was just wondering how you think about glory and dignity in relation to this trinity of um, reconciliation, solidarity, and critical judgment, and how that is distinguished from pity. Because for our end, pity, in the end, separates us. There's the pitier and the pitiable, whereas in the ideas of solidarity, there has to be all of us. Yeah. And I'm wondering how yeah. that fits with your yeah. thinking. Thank you, Roger, for that. And I think that's why I wanted it. It was far too brief, far too sketchy. Uh, but that's why I wanted to, 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 to say a little bit about what she means by a political affect or a world-disclosing affect, which I think is what she's pointing to when she says that there has to be, to, to transform the desert into a world, there has to be the conjoined faculties of passion and action. And so uh, pity, as you well know, is a, a self, it's a sentiment of the self. So Rousseau and Emile says that, that Emile has to learn pity because in pity, it, it contributes to a sense of independence. Like I look at the, the person begging on the street and Emile says, I'm very happy with my state. At least I'm not begging for, for food. So pity is all a self-sentiment. The force of the passion is, reveals something about, it affects the self. Whereas a world-disclosing affect, like anger, and she actually says that, that uh, compassion to be political needs to be transformed into anger. Compassion is always singular. Um, so uh, how I think she's, she's, uh, she's using, um, uh, as, it, as distinct from pity, the, the, the world disclosing political affects. And I think that's a totality. For her, as, we, as you well know, as we've been talking about, politics for her is worldly. As Olivia quoted Machiavelli, may I, may I love the world more than my soul. I think he says the Republic, but I think for Arendt it's, do I, will I love the world more than I will about my own self? Um, so I think, and that goes back to the, to the citation from the Dengtaga book, that secularization does not deny the importance of religion, but we have to repose the Greek immort uh, the Greek notion of earthly immortality. So just briefly, what, I, what I'm suggesting is that, that what she says in the human condition about the Greek notion of immortality, Achilles is the exemplary figure. It's the, 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 the heroic action. It's usually military. And it is individual. And the deeds of the individual, like Achilles, are then remembered through the ages. So there, the, the Greek notion of immortality is concerned with endurance. How does, the, how does the, the polis endure from one generation to another? But the endurance is heroic deeds and words that shine through the ages. Now, I think what she's saying here about a new, uh, this form of solidarity and dignity and glory is, is, I, is my, this is the thesis of my book, that she is rethinking glory not as individual and not specifically even the endurance of the polis, but how does the earth and world which now stand under the threat of total annihilation. She ends human condition with the threat of nuclear weapons. And it's like she turns the page five years later and she opens with it. The earth and world now stand under total annihilation. As if it's a continuation in my, my I think on revolution is the sequel to the human condition. And that what she's asking, and the human condition is not a celebration of the Greeks. It is a damning 
critical analysis of the modern age. And what happens to the vita activa in the modern age? What happens to the fecundity of life? What happens to the care and concern for the durability of worlds? It's gone. So I think she's looking at modern revolutions to see what resources they could offer us for responding to living under the threat of total annihilation. So it's not just new beginnings, but it's also endurance. Now, so I think that just briefly then, her notion of glory moves from individual hero heroic deeds and words to this, and, and you brought this up at the Collegium last time we were there. I kept saying political immortality, just to give you, and Roger came up to me afterwards very gently in a way that's unusual for you, Robert. Robert. You, were, you, were, you said, but Peg, she always uses earthly immortality. She never says political immortality. And oh, that got me thinking. Because I think that what she's, she expands the Greek notion to include the, the, the political, the consideration, how how is the how are the world and that has to be said in plural the plurality of worlds how is life in a plurality of worlds on a common earth going to endure under the threat of total annihilation which since 1963 we can now include climate annihilation climate catastrophe so her notion of glory in my view is begins with this notion of a new uh, form of solidarity animated by these, what I'm calling these immortal affects, these worldly affects, and conjoined with, with, with political action, but also with a new, cons with, a new with uh, rethinking the, the activity of labor and the activity of work. Because in the human condition, when she, she starts out by saying, what is, the shared con what is the shared concern of the vita activa? What do each of these three activities together, what is their shared concern? Immortality. So labor is as concerned with immortality, which I think is the care and maintenance of, of our daily life, work, which I think has the largest chapter, is on the durability of the, of the world. Uh, and then action is for the sake of new beginnings. And remember what she says. She says, I know, I'm just going on and on. Just, just, I, I get too talky. Action is, new beginnings are to save the world from ruination. She's not really talking about new, new beginnings as such. New beginnings save the world from ruination. The power of action saves us from ruin. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's the direction I would go in. Um, and I don't think it's just human dignity in her, in her, uh, there. It, 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 it may be, we may, I, but it's, it's this, the dignity of, of a plurality of worlds on a common earth. And that's why I think she, I agree with you, she, she wants to broaden that to earthly immortality and not specifically political immortality. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> uh, I'd like to comment briefly on the on the break in tradition and then I uh, uh, had also a couple of thoughts on the on the new trinity that you <laughs> that you um, offered um, so with the break in tradition and of course uh, you're <laughs> fully aware, aware of that we've uh, that is that the break in tradition in, in Arendt's uh, thought is of course not a break in tradition just in the history of ideas but it's a it's a break in tradition in the political world, right? So yeah, the yeah. Uh, the chain, the the attempt to fully change the human condition in the concentration camp, that's a break in tradition yeah. as much as the various other breakdowns. But the rubbles of the 20th century, that's the break, so mm -hmm. to speak, that 
of course, the origins respond to, and that the attempt to then write another book that could not be written after the origins, of which then <laughs> human condition, then uh, uh, introduction to politics, then uh, um, uh, on revolution, built the thread, so to speak, of this book that could not be written after the, the human, uh, after, sorry, uh, origins uh, connects to. So this, and, and the break in tradition, and, and you know because you were at the, the conference in Van, at Vanderbilt, that is, the editors now called the modern um, challenge to tradition. So that those materials, right, are, um, the break in tradition is sort of the main trope in that book that could not be written. Mm. Um, that's that's yeah, more or less thank just you a for comment. That. Yeah. Um, now, with the new trinity uh, of or it, 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 the three words of reconciliation, solidarity, and critical judgment, if I understand those mm -hmm. were the three terms that you suggested, um, I'm struggling a little bit with the first two terms in particular and also with the phrasing of the third because of the following reason. At least, and I think one of the connotations or strong connotation with reconciliation and solidarity is a notion of sameness. Right, that reconciliation is is something that creates a notion of sameness. Solidarity carries the uh, the the notion of a you know of an automatic, so to speak, of a natural togetherness. Something that she critiques in Le in the Lessing essay. And I know that you introduced the reconciliation through the quote from the introduction of the origins, uh, the preface of the origins book as a critical reconciliation. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, I wanted to point uh, to that because I, I believe that, <coughs> uh, I have one, uh, two suggestions that is related to that. Uh, and also if, if, uh, if uh, judgment, the notion of critical judgment um, is one that uh, if not, if not critical judgment has still a sort of a connection to something, to, to a point from which the, that critical distance can be created, while I see her challenge for the notion of judgment be that we need to judge freely without even the point from which we can say, this is a critical <laughs> perspective oh, okay, we can okay. take. That's but there's sort of no, there's like a real free judgment without any, any, any context. Uh, sorry, this is long. Last uh, l last remark. I was the the word that came to my mind when you were talking about reconciliation, solidarity, and judgment, and also faith was the notion of of, of imagination. And I'm wondering if what you called a new faith into something, mm -hmm. in Arendt's writing, could be also read as a way in which uh, she sort of reintroduces imagination as a faculty for political. Um, for political thinking. I, I leave it at that. Yeah, thank you so much for that. And, and um, uh, I think you're right. Uh, I, I guess, I think, imagine, and this, this is, this is I, 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 I know you've, you've written on this, uh, this notion of Ein Bildungskraft that, that comes out in her prayer, that, you know, give, make, give me the Solomon's prayer, let me have an understanding heart. And that's where I was, began to think about the, the importance of affect or, uh, in her work. Um, I think, here I, here's, here's what I would say as a first pass. I think, I think reconciliation, the facing up to what happened, I think Roger and I have a little bit of disagreement. I have more of a resistance than an acceptance. I think it's an acceptance, a bearing it, but also a resisting of it. Um, a resistance that comes out of the acceptance and the bearing. But I don't see why that would connote, so reconciliation is with a number of different paths. And I think, I think that, uh, yeah, so I wouldn't see that as, as, as the reconcil facing up to what has happened. Uh, uh, I think would be to see the past as many pasts, a plurality of pasts in terms of contributing to what has happened. And she says that nothing, nothing more marks our current age than to, the refusal to bear the shock of reality. That just runs through her work, this lying world order, this refusal 
to face what has happened. Um, so I think I would, I would see a strong sense of plurality there. As far, as far as solidarity, the call for solidarity, that the new form of solidarity in the concluding remarks of the first edition, is to, with the solidarity with the murdered, the expelled, and the still suffering. And she quotes Faulkner that the task, this new form of solidarity with the dead, the murdered, and the expelled is to is a kind of remembrance of bringing them into the human chronicle to give them their right to their time, which of course is gone. So to bring them into the human chronicle, I think she's saying we have to have, a, we have to remember. And that's going to be, again, not the same history, not the same tradition in which so much of that has been excluded. But here I think that's her debt to Herodotus, the victim, the vanquished and the victors. And, and as far as critical judgment, I think we might have a disagreement there a little bit. Um, I don't know whether for her judgment is entirely free. I think it's, Im it's, it's impartial, but I think like thinking, it's still tied, in, in fact, more so than thinking. Judgment returns us to the, to, uh, to the world and the events of the world. So she says, thinking we withdraw, there's a leave taking. And, uh, no, there's no leave taking. We withdraw in order to think more generally about these incidents and events. But then she says in that, that small little, of course never completed, uh, the kind of uh, few pages on judgment at the end of thinking. Judgment returns to the world. It, it has a robust sense of, I think, of, of wor returning to worldly events. And there she says we have another political principle. The principle of judgment, she says, at the very end of that, she refers to Cato again. And she says the principle of judgment is what old Cato said that would, the principle is we judge from the, from the position of the vanquished, not the victors. So this is, not to do, this is not to say that she, I think there's a lot there to unpack. There's, there's still this insistence on impartiality. But I think that she does give us a principle, and it's not free from what has happened. But it can, it can and there's where I think, I think the, the, you're right about imagination. It, remember, she, she says it brings what is distant closer, what's too close, we gain some distance on. Um, and, I, and then, she, then she says, this is what Kant meant by an, uh, Ein Bildungskraft, this, this, judgment, this notion of imagination. So I don't know if that helps. It's a great question. I, I hesitated with my secularized trinity. I don't know, it's probably still too religious. But I do think these three components offer us something in, in how to... to uh, to think about something like the endurance of not only these principles of a freedom and equality, but in a larger sense, the endurance of a plurality of worlds on a common earth. Thank you. Thank you.